I'm not going to go terribly spiritually deep tonight because there's just a different kind of direction that I want to go tonight. <clears throat> Tomorrow's July 4th, otherwise known as Independence Day in America. If you're British, happy treason day to all the ungrateful colonials. July 4th, 1776, that is the day that we celebrate our independence. It's the day we celebrate our freedom, which is why we were singing about freedom earlier tonight. Uh, <laughs> we were in rehearsal on Thursday night, and Laddie comes up to me and says, hmm, I wonder what you're going to be preaching on on Saturday night. <clears throat> Maybe freedom? The title for the, uh, for the message tonight is The Struggle for Freedom. And we're going to get into some scriptural concepts, but before that, I want to get into some history, some American history, <clears throat> since, uh, since tomorrow's July 4th. You know, there's a, the old adage that says, those who do not learn from the mistakes of history are doomed to repeat the mistakes of history. Amen. But you know what? History is, is valuable for more than just learning from your mistakes. You can also learn from your successes. You can learn from the things that you did right and say, okay, how do I reproduce that? How do I be successful a second time and a third time? Especially when you're a, a kingdom citizen and you know that the laws of the kingdom don't change. So if you tapped into God's laws one time and you reap the benefits of that, then you need to look back and say, okay, how did I do that? What, what kingdom principle came into action there? How did I achieve success? Because I know the law doesn't change, so if I do it again, I'll achieve success a, set, a second time. And a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and you build a pattern of success. So history is a good thing. You can learn from your mistakes, but you can also learn from your successes. Amen. The United States of America is the greatest nation on this planet. Amen? Amen. But there are a lot of Americans that don't believe that. There's a lot of Americans that don't believe we're the greatest nation on earth. Now, I'm not saying America's perfect. I'm not saying that we don't have uh, sins of the past that have stained our record. I'm not saying that we can't stand to improve. I'm not saying that there's not skeletons in our closet. But I'm saying that when you look at America as the whole total package deal, all the good and all the bad, there's no other place I'd rather live. And for when people say that, you know, that America's not as great as we say it is, well, I'm just wondering where would you rather live that's better than this? What place provides more opportunity than America does? No other nation has done more good for the worldwide scheme of things in the last 200 years than our nation has. <clears throat> because of our successful model of government, democracy is spreading all over the world. It's spreading into nations that when I was growing up, I thought, well, they'll, they'll never be democratic. They will always be a dictatorship. They will always be communists. They, they will always, they'll never have freedom. But we're seeing it happen in places that we never thought it would happen before. Because of our nation's wealth, we have been able to pour trillions of dollars in aid into nations all over the world. Some nations that even hate us. We've been able to help them. <laughs> And when tragedy strikes our soil, how many of them ever lift a finger to help us? America's done a lot of good for a lot of people. Because of our military might, we have overthrown evil regimes. We've kept tyrannical dictatorships from achieving their agenda. We've held evil people at bay. We have funded the gospel and funded the kingdom in a way that no other nation ever has. Amen. So for those people that think that America is reserved for judgment, America has done a lot for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Now, like I said, we're not perfect, but 
I challenge you to find a better, I mean, look at the, at the grand scheme of things, the big picture of what America is and what we've accomplished and the good that we've done in the world. Think of the technology and, and the inventions and the American ingenuity that has improved the world. We were the first to fly. We were the first to uh, split the atom. We were the first to put somebody on the moon. We have led the world in, in technology. We've done a lot of good. America is an awesome place to live. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm proud to be an American, and I'm proud to be a Christian living in America. Amen. 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 July 4th, 1776 is the day that we celebrate our independence. It's the birth of our nation, but it really didn't happen on July 4th. In fact, it didn't happen on a day at all. July 4th was part of the beginning of a process for us to become free from a tyrannical government. We began a process. I say began because it didn't happen overnight. In fact, it started long before July 4th, and it was settled long after July 4th. And it wasn't settled without a fight. The enemy, don't want, he doesn't want to let you go. The colonies had been debating about breaking free from British rule for several years. But in 1775 and 1776, relations between America and, and Britain had gotten really, really bad. Britain was taxing the American colonies, but they weren't allowing the colonies to have any representation in their government. That's where we get the phrase taxation without representation. The, the, the colonies were getting taxed all right, but they didn't have a voice. They, they weren't able to speak. You know, that's one of the reasons that it bothers me so much when I see people stand on a national stage and they will disrespect the national anthem, they'll disrespect our flag, they'll disrespect America, but they seem to forget that the only reason that they're standing on that stage is because America let them have a voice. Where would they have that anywhere else? So, Britain was taxing us. They weren't giving us a voice. And people were getting restless. People were getting fed up. You know, you can only treat people unfairly for so long before they say enough is enough. And by the way, in case you haven't <laughs> been awake for the last couple of years... There is an underlying tone of restlessness in our society today. People are starting to get fed up. They're starting to get fed up with the, corrup the corruption in government. They're starting to get fed up with a biased media. They're start starting to get fed up with the lies. But that's a sermon for another day. <laughs> October of 1774, the colony sent a list of grievances to King George III and the grievances went unanswered. So a few months later, in spring of 1775, hostilities broke out between American colonists and British troops in Massachusetts. That was in spring of 75. A few months later, in summer of 75, King George declared that the American colonies were in outright rebellion. So the American Continental Congress responded to that by forming the Continental Army. And they placed George Washington in charge of it. That was summer of 75. A year later, in June of 1776, most Americans were in favor of breaking off from Great Britain. So there was a congressman in Virginia. His name was Richard Henry Lee. And Richard Henry Lee, I'm sorry, Thomas Henry Lee, he proposed severing all ties from Great Britain. So he put a, a proposal before the Continental Congress. The Congress voted on it. This was June of 76. And in that same month, they created a delegation of five men who were in charge of drafting a document to declare our independence from Britain. Those five men were John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Livingston, Roger Sherman, and Thomas Jefferson was selected to be the principal drafter of the Declaration of Independence. Now... This all happened in fairly short order because the proposal from uh, Thomas Henry Lee 
Uh, that came forward in early June. The second week of June, they appointed these five men, and by June 28th, they had uh, a draft of the Declaration of Independence was already created by June 28th. So this thing was, was put together in just a couple of weeks. These people knew what they wanted to say. And so on June 28th, they submitted it to Congress for them to review and to vote on it. Congress debated it on July 1st. Now remember, we had 13 colonies. Nine colonies were in favor of independence. Two colonies, Pennsylvania and South Carolina, were opposed to it. One colony, Delaware, was undecided. And then one colony, New York, they had to abstain from the vote. The reason that they had to abstain from the vote was the delegates from New York were instructed only to pursue reconciliation with King George. Look, if we can settle this without a fight, we will. We would love to reconcile if we can. So New York, we're going to have you abstain from the vote so that you can appear before King George and let him know that we want to reconcile. So in other words, New York, you can't vote for independence and attempt peaceful reconciliation at the same time. So that was July 1st. By July 2nd, the next day, an extra delegate from Delaware showed up to vote, and that shifted Delaware from being undecided to being in favor of independence. South Carolina changed their mind, and so they were now in favor of independence. And then the delegates from Pennsylvania who were opposed decided not to show up to vote. So the colonies voted on July 2nd, and it passed 12 to 0 with New York abstaining from the vote. And John Adams told his wife that July 2nd would be celebrated as a national holiday. And of course it's not. <laughs> we celebrate it on July 4th. Now, after the vote on July 2nd, Congress continued to debate the Declaration of Independence. They made some edits to it, made some edits to some of the wording, and they approved the final draft on July 4th. That's why the Declaration of Independence reads, in Congress, July 4th, 1776. So the, the final draft was approved on July 4th, and that's why we celebrate on the 4th. But the signing of the Declaration of Independence did not happen on July 4th. That happened on August 2nd. There were 56 signatures on it, and seven of those 56 did not sign it on August 2nd. They weren't there. They signed it later, sometime between August and January of 1777. So again, this didn't happen overnight. The Declaration of Independence was proposed, it was drafted, it was debated upon, it was voted on, it was approved, it was edited, and then it was signed. So that's it. America's now free, right? No. Wrong. <laughs> because the enemy's not gonna let you go without a fight. That applies to your enemy as well. Now, when the Declaration of Independence was signed on August 2nd, there was a man named Benjamin Rush from Pennsylvania, and he wrote about the pensive and awful silence which pervaded the House when we were called up one after another to the table of the President of Congress to sign what was believed by many at that time to be our own death warrants. These men were declaring independence from Britain. They were declaring their victory. They were declaring the fact that we are breaking off from you. They were not clapping and shouting. They were not celebrating. These men knew that there was probably going to be a steep price to pay for this. And they were correct. Five of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were captured by the British and tortured as traitors. Nine of the 56 signers of the Declaration fought and died in the American Revolution. Four of the 56 Declaration signers lost their sons in the Continental Army or had sons who were captured. At least a dozen of the 56 Declaration signers had their homes looted and destroyed. There was a price to pay for this. And I want to point out some of these signers and what they had to pay. There was a man by the name of Richard Stockton. 
He was a New Jersey State Supreme Court Justice. He returned to his estate in Princeton, New Jersey to find that his wife and his children were living like refugees after being betrayed by an American colonist who supported the British. British troops captured him. They threw him in jail where he almost starved to death. And then when he was finally released, he went home to find that his estate had been looted and burned and he had been beaten so badly in prison that he died before the war ended. His surviving family lived the rest of their lives off of charity. That man's signature was on one of the greatest documents ever created. And I hope that his family knew what their sacrifice was worth. Because what he did was part of the process that made us free. At the Battle of Yorktown on the York River in Virginia, there was a man named Thomas Nelson Jr. Thomas Nelson Jr.'s home had been overrun by British General Charles Cornwallis. Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home and turned it into his headquarters. So Thomas Nelson Jr. urged General George Washington to open fire on his own home because it had been fallen, it, it had been taken into enemy hands. So this was done, Nelson's home was destroyed, and Cornwallis' uh, forces later surrendered uh, at Yorktown in 1781, and that ended the fighting in the American Revolution. That man lost his house over this, and he was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and he died bankrupt. Carter Braxton of Virginia, he was a wealthy planter, and he was a trader, not traitor, trader, he traded. He saw his ships destroyed by the British Navy. He sold his home and his properties to pay off his debts, and he died in rags. His signature is on the Declaration of Independence. Thomas McKean was hounded by the British uh, Army so much that he was forced to, to move his family around constantly. He served in the American Continental Congress without pay, and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and his reward was poverty. His signature's on the Declaration of Independence. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The British enemies jailed his wife, and she died within a few months. His signature's on the Declaration. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and his grist mill were laid to waste. For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves. He returned home to find his wife dead, and his children were gone. They had vanished. A few weeks later, he died from exhaustion and a broken heart. His signature is on the Declaration of Independence. These men knew when they were signing that this was only the beginning, only the first step in the process of becoming free. I was sharing some of this with uh, my wife a few days ago, and I was telling her the story of what some of these guys lost after they had signed the Declaration of Independence. And Louise quoted David from the Bible. She said, is there not a cause? These men knew that there was a cause, and they knew that there was a, pr a price to pay for it. David, when he was young, he came down to the battlefield where Goliath was taunting Israel, and David said, basically, what are you guys sta standing around for? Who is this guy? Who, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Are you going to let Goliath intimidate you? Is there not a cause? In other words, is there not a great reward on the other side of this battle? Is there not a cause worth fighting for? Is there not a great reward on the other side of this challenge? Is there not an awesome reward on the other side of this obstacle? Is there not a cause? The Revolutionary War started with some small battles and some skirmishes that began in 1775. And there were even some skirmishes that occurred in the years prior to that. Britain did not formally acknowledge America's independence until 1783 at the Treaty of Paris. So after the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, we had to fight for seven years to achieve our freedom. Men were killed for this. 
Men lost their homes for this. Men lost their families for this. They lost their businesses for this. They lost their fortunes for this. For you and me. Men died bankrupt for this. I, I know it's a cliche, but it's true. Freedom is never free. People had to pay for our freedom. Now again, I'm not going to go terribly deep spiritually in the message tonight, but here's my simple question. What if these people had decided to quit before the Treaty of Paris in 1783? What if these people decided, you know what, losing my house, losing my farm, losing my wife, losing my children, losing my ships. What if they had decided the price was too high? What if the men fighting in the American Revolution decided the war was too rough? What if they decided they'd rather have a hot meal than freezing to death in the middle of winter? What if the people involved said this? What if they said, you know, Britain, yeah, they overtaxed us and their, their soldiers, they, they were kind of rough on us, they were kind of tyrannical, but at least I had a job, at least I had a family. You know, Israel did that. When they were released from Egyptian slavery, they told Moses, we would have rather died in Egypt than to die out here in the desert. Right. What if they would have quit? They had to see the process through to the very end. In 1776, when they signed this, they didn't know if it would be settled in seven weeks or seven months or seven years or if it would never be settled at all. They didn't know what the future held. Imagine if in 1782, after fighting for six years of independence, not knowing that freedom was only a year away, imagine if they would have quit then. What if they would have quit? If they would have quit, the greatest nation in the history of mankind would never have come into existence. The struggle for freedom was years long, but it was well worth it. Because of what we have today. Amen. You may be struggling to overcome something. And you may not know how long it's going to take for you to achieve what you're struggling for. But don't quit. Because on the other side of this cause. On the other side of this battle. There's freedom. Amen. Amen. These men had an idea of the kind of life that they wanted to create. And it was a kind of life that they really had not seen a picture of. They had lived under tyrannical British rule. They wanted to live under freedom. They knew the kind, they had an idea of what they wanted to create for themselves, for their families, for their fellow countrymen. And they knew that if they wanted it, they had to create it. It was not going to be handed to them. Now, compare that to today. We have an entire generation of people that live with an entitlement mentality. Amen. Because so few people today have ever had to create anything. They've never had to build anything. They've never had to fight for anything. They've had everything handed to us on a silver platter. Now, some people listening to this message, you might say, well, my life wasn't handed to me on a silver platter. You know, I, I, I know what it's like to be poor. Well, I'm going to say it like this. Even if you live at the poverty level, the American definition of the poverty level, you're still richer than 97% of the rest of the planet. Yeah. Yes. We're a blessed nation. Amen. But a lot of people, they've never had to create something. These men wanted to create something. And they knew that the only way that they were going to get it is if they created it themselves. Nobody was going to give it to them. Two and a half years ago, I decided to create something. I had about 30 people that approached me and said that they wanted to help me create it. Our church is two and a half years old. And it's been a great two and a half years. But it's also been a challenging two and a half years. We've had to deal with other churches in this town talking about us. Spreading lies about us. And even after two and a half years, some of it still hasn't stopped. We've endured criticism. We've endured gossip. We've endured betrayal. I don't talk about it too much. 
And one of the reasons that I don't talk about it too much is that I don't want your opinion of other people to hinder your ability to receive from them if there's a ministry that they have that'll minister to you. We've seen leaders here come and go, some of them because life circumstances have changed and they've moved or whatever. We've had some people come and go because they weren't willing to embrace the vision of the house. We've had to create things. We've created great things with limited budgets and limited manpower. We have a children's ministry, folks, in which kids beg their, ch their, beg their parents to bring them back to church. That, that's, that is a blessing to me as a pastor. When I see kids beg their mom, beg their dad, can we come back next week? We build a ton of momentum with our youth group in the past couple of months. Despite the fact that our youth group is now on their third set of leaders. <laughs> We've created an internationally broadcast television ministry. Despite the fact that no one in this church has any previous experience in television production. And <laughs> they gave us free airtime. We can't even afford to buy our own facility yet, but we're preaching via satellite all over the world. We produced two awesome VBS programs. One of them we're about to start in about a week or so. Using volunteers, some of which don't even go to this church. We're blessed. We've had two motorcycle rallies. We've reached over 250 bikers. We've given away two Harley Davidsons. We produce some of the most excellent praise and worship music that you're going to find in Southwest Florida. Amen. Using amateur singers and amateur musicians. Amen? And these amateurs currently are working on a, on a recording project. And we're producing it in-house. Amen. God's good to us. We've experienced powerful moves of the Spirit of God. We've seen God move in power and demonstration. We've seen people operate in prophetic unction. We've seen healings. We've seen miracles. We've seen answered prayers. We've seen supernatural provision. God's good. And I don't want to toot my own horn too loudly, but I also know what kind of teaching and preaching you're going to find at most churches, and we don't preach pablum here. That's right. Amen? I mean, I, I, again, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I, I just know there's revelation knowledge that comes from this pulpit that you don't hear very often. Amen. But what if we had decided to quit? That's right. What if we said, you know, too many people around town are talking negatively about us. We're never going to build momentum with this kind of opposition. Let's, let's just pack it up. Too many people are spreading lies about us. How, do we, how are we going to overcome that? Too many people have divided loyalties with other churches. How do I compete with that? You know, when we first started this church, most of the people that came to this church attended more than one church. And that's simply because when you have church, when we first started, we started on Thursday night and Saturday night. That left people free to go to churches on Wednesday nights and Sundays. And so we had people that served multiple churches. And some people served over at New Hope. Some people went to Parkway. Some people went to Destiny. Some people went to Paradise Coast. Some people went to Grow Church. Some people went to Tree of Life. But what if I would have said, you know, I can't pastor a church full of people who don't know where they want to go to church. Did you know that our praise and worship team went for over a year without having a praise and worship rehearsal? You know why? Because we had limited access to this building, so we only had it for certain nights of the week, and I couldn't find a night of the week that everybody could get together and rehearse. It wasn't until we moved our Thursday night service to Wednesday nights that that freed up th Thursday night here at the building, and we could have a, a praise and worship rehearsal. But what if I would have said, you know, I can't even get my praise team to show up for a rehearsal. So let's just give up. There were times I'd come to church and 20 people would be here. And sometimes I got disheartened. You know, especially when you're a guy. I mean, I've been in ministry for over 25 years. I'm accustomed to leading worship in front of hundreds or even thousands of people at a time. There were times that we would plan an event 
And everyone would say, yeah, I'm looking forward to that event, and they'd sign up for it. And then 25 or 40% of the people would, would uh, call us up and back out at the last minute. Early on, when we first started this church, Louise and I were doing everything. We were doing everyone's job. We were running the youth department. We were running children's ministry. We were running social media. We were maintaining the website. We were in charge of meals. We were cleaning up the building after service. We were communicating with volunteers. We were casting vision. And on top of all of that, I was leading worship. I was preaching. I was editing all of our messages. I was posting things to YouTube. Louise and I were both putting in 70 to 90 hours every single week. And why were we doing all of it? Well, because at that time, no one else could do it. People were busy. And, and I understood that. But even if no one else could do it, it still needed to be done. There were certain times where we would have a person who was a figurehead leader, but really, Louise and I were the ones doing all the work behind the scenes. But what if, what if she and I would have said, you know what? We're burning the candle at both ends. We're burning ourselves out. And I don't see anything changing. Let's hang it up. Some of you are aware of the challenges that we faced sharing this building with two other churches. That's been a challenge. We, we've come in here. We've, <laughs> there's been services where we've come in here. People have taken our equipment. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes accidentally. People have come in and they've changed settings on our audio system or changed other settings, removed pieces of tech, removed cables without informing us. Times we came in here and the building was a complete mess because one of the other churches had an event and they didn't clean up afterwards. Times that we'd come into church, we found that we had no toilet paper, no bathroom soap, no paper towels, no trash can liners, no printer paper. We'd come in, uh, this happened more than once, we'd come in and find out that people had broken into our supply closet and took paper plates or dinnerware or other things that we use without asking. We've even had some personality conflicts with people, <laughs> you know, especially if they were immature people that were placed in positions of leadership that were too big for them. <clears throat> We've had people mess with our light settings, mess with the audio settings. We came into church one day and found that the entire hard drive on our uh, computer uh, was erased. Don't have, we lost all of our files, lost all of our songs, lost everything. People mess with the projectors. We've had some frustrating challenges. But we didn't quit. Why did we not quit? Because the Bible tells us, don't be weary in doing well. Don't be weary while you're doing good. In due season, you're going to reap if you don't lose heart. In due season, you'll reap if you don't give up. In due season, you're going to reap if you don't let go. If you hold fast to your profession of faith. There's, there's a cause. And there's a blessing on the other side of the cause. There's a blessing on the other side of this challenge. We knew that faith is tenacious. Yep. Right? It's a fully persuaded, single-minded, tenacious agreement with God and his word. Tenacious means it doesn't give up. Amen. We knew that the Bible tells us this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Amen. It overcomes. Shout, I'm an overcomer. We knew that God tells us that if you're faithful in the little things, I'm going to make you ruler over many things. You've got to be faithful with the small things that God gives you. You have to be, be faithful with the resources that he gives you. Because what that is, it's a test. If you, can, if you can be faithful with this, I'm going to give you more. But I'm not going to start you here. I'm going to start you here. That's why the Bible says, do not despise your day of small beginnings. Don't despise small beginnings because small beginnings is where the test happens. He tests you in the small things. When you're faithful in the small things, he makes you ruler over bigger things. Amen. Amen? That's a kingdom principle. And so now, after two and a half years of God being faithful to his word and two and a half years of us being good stewards of what God has given us, God has blessed us with another facility. Amen. Most of you know this. Uh, we've been talking about this for the last couple of months. This building has been sold. 
And uh, we were told back in March that we were going to have to vacate the building in June. And so we, we talked with the other church and we said, uh, can you give us until July instead of June? Because in July we want to do a VBS. We want to reach out to children. It's very important to me that we reach out to children and youth and young families. We need to be preparing the next generation. So we said, can you give us until July instead of June? And they said, uh, yeah, we'll give you until July. Well, then we found out that the other two churches uh, were planning on being here until the end of October. So we said, can you give us until the end of October? Because we need some time to find another building, another, another facility. Folks, I'm just telling you, we've been looking for the last few months. It is not easy to find a venue for a church in Naples, Florida. It's not easy to find property here. Real estate is egregiously expensive here. I mean, it should be a sin. <laughs> land in this area, I mean, if, if the land is worth buying at all, it's $500,000 an acre minimum. Sometimes as much as $800,000 to a $1 million an acre. And look, if you're going to build a church on some land, then you need enough land that you can grow into that land. Right. I, I, I'm not going to build something that we're going to outgrow in 24 months. So you don't need two acres, you, you don't need five acres, you need 10 acres or more. And so you're talking millions of dollars to buy land and you haven't even put a building on it yet. And when you look for rental property here in Naples, just to let you know, we have been extremely blessed for the past two and a half years to have this facility. We have, th this facility is 6,500 square feet. 6,500 square feet. And the person who owned this was a Christian, and so she knew that churches were meeting here, so she offered a discount on what we were paying for rent. So we were really paying probably around half of what this building is actually worth in this market. Not only were we paying half, but we were only paying a third of that half because two other churches were sharing the rent with us. So we got this place for a song. I mean, we really, we were very blessed to have this property for the price that we were paying. But what that means is that once you break out on your own and you've got to find another 6,500 square foot facility, you're going to be paying five or six times as much. Right. And not only that, if you find retail land or retail property, most retail places don't want a church to move in there. They want, they want retail to stay there. But even if they allowed you to move into a 6,500 square foot retail place, most of them don't have enough parking for a church. Most places that have 6,000 square foot or so, they have 15 or 20 parking spaces. That's not big enough for a church. Churches are kind of a weird animal when it comes to real estate. So we came to the conclusion that the only thing that's, that's gonna meet our need is we've gotta find another church that's willing to share a building with us. Do you realize how difficult that is? Think about it. Once a church has overcome all of these obstacles and they get into their own facility, they don't want to rent it to anybody else. They've already achieved what they wanted to achieve. They finally got a building of their own. They don't want somebody else coming in and messing all of their stuff up. <laughs> so what happened was Debbie Vargas got on the phone and she beat the phones. She was making cold calls. She was calling every church in the area, asking them, hey, we're a church. We would love to share your facility. No, thank you. No, thank you. Not interested. Not interested. Over and over and over again. She was calling people. She was sending out emails. She's reaching out to people. And it, it was a really difficult challenge trying to find somebody who was willing to share a building with us. And remember, I, we had asked the other church, can we stay until October? But we didn't get a response from them. So we knew we got to be out of here by July. And what have I said several times over the past few months? We'll have what we need when we need it. Amen. Amen? And so we had to be out of here by the end of July. Well, it just so happens because everything's a coincidence. <laughs> Two weeks ago, God opened up a door for another church to share their facility with us. That church is Oasis Naples Church. Kale, put that uh, uh, 
do the outdoor shop, please. Yeah. Oasis Naples Church. It's also known as 10th Street Church of God. So uh, this building, this facility is twice the size of what we're in right now. God's a good God. Amen. Amen. Oasis Church is the second oldest church in Naples. It was founded in 1922, so it's almost 100 years old. Pastor Mike McKellar and I were beginning to develop a good uh, friendship, a good relationship. I uh, met him a few weeks ago. Uh, they have opened up their entire facility to us. This is, amen, give God praise to that. The big A-frame building there uh, is the um, sanctuary building. They have two other buildings that are attached to it, and then there's also a big uh, uh, fellowship hall. So they've opened up the entire facility. The, the facility, like I said, is twice the size of this facility, but are you ready for the big blessing? Yeah. They have agreed to rent that facility to us for the same price as what we've been paying here. <laughs> and this was already a steal. Amen. Yeah. Amen? I'm telling you, in order for us to have a facility that big, we would probably have to pay 10 times the amount of rent that they're going to charge us. Wow. Now, it is going to be a little bit more expensive for us to move into that facility because our share of the utilities is going to go up. But the actual rent payment itself is the same as what we're paying here. God is good. Yeah. Right. Show us the sanctuary, Caleb. The sanctuary seats about 225 people. Uh, this sanctuary, I think, if we fill it up, I think it seats 180. So uh, the sanctuary is a little bit bigger. Plenty of room to have live praise and worship. It's got a huge stage. Uh, they've already informed us that we can make changes to the facility to fit our ministry. So if we want to make changes to the sound system, if we want to make changes to the lighting, uh, changes to the stage, they are completely okay with that. They're on board with that. They also have a large fellowship hall. Uh, Go to that picture, Caleb. The fellowship hall is about the same size as this sanctuary is. Maybe, maybe just a little bit smaller, but roughly the same size as this, this room. It has a fully functional kitchen. There's the kitchen. We love our meals, don't we? Fully functional kitchen. It's got a, uh, two stoves, two ovens. Uh, it's got a big commercial hood above the oven. Uh, it's got a three-bay sink. It's got a dishwasher, got a refrigerator, plenty of cabinets. And Fly has said that they want to use that to hold uh, youth meetings for Fly, and they're going to designate it the hangar for Fly. They also have a large children's ministry area, really nice looking children's ministry. They, uh, they've got puppet stages, they've got a sound system, they've got a projector screen, computers. Uh, they also have an attached kitchenette with a uh, commercial refrigerator in there. There's also uh, a large uh, nursery area, which we don't have a picture of. Uh, Kale, show us the um, uh, overhead uh, picture, the bird's eye picture. Um, on top of the, uh, so if you look at the, uh, from left to right, the left is north, right is south, because this picture is taken from the, uh, the west side of the property. So you have the north parking lot, then you have the sanctuary building, that's the big A-frame building, and then uh, the building there on the, uh, uh, where it says cafe and nursery, that's one building, and there's a few uh, other uh, rooms attached to that as well. Then there's the children's facility, then you have a little parking lot on the south side there, and then you have the fellowship hall, which uh, like again, uh, uh, Fly's gonna call that the hangar. Approximately double the square footage, and the rent is the same as what we're paying here. Again, this, this is amazing favor. This is the favor of God. But how did this happen? It happened because we followed a kingdom principle. We were faithful where we were planted, and God gave us greater. Amen? We didn't quit. We didn't give up. Even though we didn't know how long the struggle was going to last. We, we didn't know how long we were going to have to struggle with the, with the challenges that we had. But we didn't give up. We faced challenges. We didn't quit. We chose to ignore the lies. We chose to ignore what people were saying about us. We endured betrayals. We pushed through the frustrations. And what did God do? He gave us double for our trouble. 
Amen? I don't know how many were here a few weeks ago. I was up in Indiana. Danny preached the message. And we had a time of altar ministry at the end. And during that time, Ernie prophesied that God was giving us double for our trouble. That's before any of that happened. That happened about a week or so later. God gave us double for our trouble. And you know the best part of all of this? As wonderful as that is, that's not our promise. That's our provision on the way to our promise. Amen? We've still got our promise to look forward to. We've still got our property to look forward to. Our promised land. This is a nice provision. But it's the provision on the way to our promise. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to what God's going to do after this. Amen? God's a good God. Now, I don't want to compare our struggle with the struggle of our founding fathers. Nobody had to die for anything. Amen? But I will say there was a kingdom principle that was put into action. And that is you don't quit. You don't give up. You get vision. You, you, you set your face like flint. And you go and you press forward. And you, you allow God to anoint you and to lead you and to guide you and to empower you and to provide for you. And you don't quit. You don't give up because there's a cause. Amen. There's a good cause. Amen. And God has blessed us. Amen. Amen. Can we give God a great praise for that tonight? Amen. Hi, I'm Heath. And I'm Louise. And we want to thank you so much for watching this video. Faith Life Worship Center in Naples, Florida is a Bible-believing, spirit-filled, non-denominational church. If you live in Southwest Florida and you're looking for a good church with a fun and energetic contemporary worship experience, awesome children and youth ministries, and a great family atmosphere, we'd love to see you at one of our services really soon. Go to faithlifeworshipcenter.com to learn more about our church, watch other messages online, check out our store, or support our ministry financially. Please take a few seconds to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also find us on social media. We hope that you'll watch other messages online, but what we really want is to see you in person at Faith Life Worship Center. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.